Podcast. I'm your host, James O'Hagan. I'm here with Danny Martin today. Danny is now the CEO, CEO of a rebranded company, once known as Geekleaks, now known as Exposure. Danny, thank you for being on the Academy of Esports Podcast today. No problem. I've been anxious to get onto the podcast, so definitely, truly appreciative for the experience. Well, Danny, if there was ever somebody who I guess we could call OG in this industry, you have been doing this a lot longer than I think people realize. How how long have you been involved, not just with Geek Leads, but kind of going back into the esports industry? Yeah, so I started um, in this space by hosting tournaments in college, and that was 2010. Mm -hmm. um, so that was my moment where I was fixing consoles and engaging with um, the community within my college. And just, I recognize that gamers want to compete. And by me being a athlete in college, during our off times, what do we do? We still competed. We just competed in video games. Mm -hmm. And being an entrepreneurship major, I just wanted to be able to turn that into a business. And tournament organizing, um, TOs, that was the thing, uh, because I just have a passion for supporting um, individuals who like the game and who want to be known as the best individuals all around the world. So. That was just my little element of figuring out how to get better and better at tournament organizing. Um, and that's that's essentially where it started. And from here, uh, now we're on to you know, even larger things. Well, and, and it's not just even larger things, but let's go back to around that 2014, 2015 time too, when, when you finally launched Geek Leads, which again, now has become Exposure. Uh -huh. uh, I read on your website talking about the dojo and how you took a loft that, that was in, I believe it was in Dallas, Texas, right? The loft yeah. was in Dallas and yeah. <laughs> turned it into the space. But people must, I mean, as an entrepreneur, as a businessman, as somebody who's trying to raise money for a business, 2014, 2015, people are not thinking about esports. Like you you say the word esports, yeah. and a lot of people don't have a clue as to what you're talking about, or they thought maybe you uh, misspoke or something. How yeah. did you convince people like, hey, this is gonna be a legitimate business. This is something that, that really is growing. Because I know when I talk to people in 2014, 2015 about esports, and I was telling somebody yesterday, I would do inter I would do um, uh, conferences, and I'd get two or three people in a room, and that was it. And yeah, now it's like you can't. Sure. Now the room is like standing room only. So yeah, how, for sure. how did you convince people that that esports and and your vision for geek leads and now exposure has become uh, what it is today? Yeah, one it's just my burning designer and passion uh, for the space. And it just stems from helping individuals. You know, like when you're gaming or when you're in an industry where people don't know what you're doing and they always, they kind of question it. And so I felt that myself. And so for me, and I wanted to make sure that when somebody else is in the same position, they don't have to feel as dire as I did to just express what I really love to do. Like, I like the game. You know, mm -hmm. I like this industry and uh, convincing individuals was not the easiest task. The only thing I really had was my passion. <laughs> and really, when I start to bring in data points, the data points for a VC or someone who really wants to invest, those data points is not as high. So they're almost like, what? You know, I can do mm -hmm. real estate or I can do, you know, I can do anything that I want outside of this. And I don't understand it. It's a whole different demographic of individuals. Uh, so convincing was extremely difficult. And so which became really good because, you know, after a certain point, you really didn't really want to convince anybody anymore. You just wanted to show them, you know. So, you know, at that point, you know, when I knew that tournament organizing was uh, an awesome opportunity and the precedence of esports, it allowed me to understand that, OK, how can I turn this into a software platform and, you know, traveling up to San Francisco, spending three years up there working with tech startups, I understood how to build those platforms and build a company around them. And ultimately, I easily recognized it like, man, you got the Smash GGs, you got the Battle Fives, you got the, all the platforms out there that are good for tournament organizing. But I'm trying to figure out how did they convince someone to give them three million, one million dollars? Mm -hmm. You know, like just how do you how do you convince? And so from that perspective, I took that law, I built the platform, took that law, converted it, which that was my home. And mm -hmm. I knew oh, like, I okay, well. Wait, whoa, 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 yeah. hold on a second. Yeah. You believed in this so much. <laughs> You took your own house and turned it into a place to invite in strangers to conduct business. Yeah, for sure. I literally took this, the basement of the in downtown, and it was actually going for really cheap because nobody wanted to be in the basement. It was leaky and things like that. So I just went in and, and, and built it out, fixed it, a lot of the stuff to save me some cost. I took the bottom floor, which was considered the living room. I took all, I took, I, I put five consoles up on the walls on it was cement so I drilled them in the cement and then five of them on the other side 
and I took my upstairs bedroom, which overlooked the, uh, the living room, and I turned that into a spectator seating area so people can see on the TVs all the, S like all the uh, HDMIs was ported to the wall. And they can come there and actually watch the events. And that was my way of, I have this tech platform. It would allow people to come in and test the platform if there was a tournament organizer. And when they go host their tournaments, they bring the gamers inside of there. So that really gave us a good proof of concept. So I will ask questions like, how did you like utilizing our platform? You know, was the UI good? You know, was the functionality adhered to your particular community? Whether you're sports games or fighting games or League of Legends, I was able to get hands-on knowledge right then and there and take it into the dev room of that same loft and start working on the technology portion of it. And so it was like that. It was like our beta testing home, which you see all the time in esports where these teams go into these gaming homes and they practice, 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 get better. Right. For me, being the entrepreneur, that was my dojo to allow us to have information to build out a really good platform for the use of tournament organizers to the, to the openness to understand that you know, if you help tournament organizers, you're ultimately helping the gamers get more opportunities. And then I easily recognize that, man, these these gamers are coming in. Well, to be completely frank, when you're creating a technology platform, you want to adhere to all the different communities, but they're all different. And mm -hmm. so that was our biggest reality. It was like, man, we can't we can't try to create one platform for League of Legends and Counter Strike and NBA 2K and fight you know uh, the the fighting game community because they're all different. They all want different things for their platform. And so we really was just like that was the realization for me. It was just like sit back, Danny, figure out which community you want to be in, what you can provide the most, and. For me, I was an athlete, so sports games was the thing for me, but you can't go to a VC and say, hey, you know, we want to create this platform for sports games because it's nowhere near compared to League of Legends or Counter-Strike. So that provided an opportunity. I could have been looking at it as like, oh, dang, I want to go <laughs> adhere to a League of Legends, but no, that's not authentic, right? So mm -hmm. for me, I was just like, well, if I can go create value in this community, that's more authentic. And ultimately, hopefully, that can be on the same pipeline as that of the League of Legends or any other known um, esports uh, organizations that are out there. And so ultimately, I easily identified that one of the biggest reasons for sports games is because there's a 1v1 element for every game in sports when you have a 5v5 element in the known brands. And so easily, once I identify which game has a 5v5 element, which is five individuals versus another five individuals, mm -hmm. I've seen that NBA 2K you know, was that game in 2K16, and I was like, okay, perfect. If we can start with 2K16, build this organic community, provide opportunities for these tournament organizers and the competitors, then that can spring up the value in this software platform, and then we just start to see it grow when the actual NBA 2K League came a part of it, and then the rest is history. Well, and let's and let, and first off, I live not far from where the Milwaukee Bucks play in practice. I live in Racine, mm -hmm. Wisconsin. The Bucks have been so willing to share. They've been so willing to reach out and work with us. And in fact, I've been working with them to develop our taste and take of the NBA 2K League using the 3v3 blacktop. But we're going to yes. build in an element of uh, League of Legends style drafts. So it's not stale, same players every time. Um, which they're like, hey, that's a cool idea. But that's the nice thing about this is we can cut this up any way that we want to, right? We can make this, but what I, what I really want to get at is you've got a loft and I picture, here's what I picture because you call it the dojo, right? Yeah. <clears throat> I watched recently the uh, ESPN documentary on Bruce Lee called Be Like Water. And he mm -hmm. talked about how he started teaching people. And back then, you know, we're talking the early 60s when he's teaching people karate, or I guess Jeet Kune Do is what his, his yes. style was. Um, it was like, you know, people walking into these things, not knowing what to expect. I imagine you probably had that first person who walks in your door, who is just like off the street, sees something, caught something, caught wind of something that must've been like, I don't know that they become per a person who really bought into what you were doing or they were like ran yeah. away or what, what was that experience? Like that first Man. experience. That experience is uh, unbelievable, almost like it's so humbling and almost like emotional for me because, you know, we were in the basement and on the street level in downtown, we were in the back of downtown. So that's where, you know, a lot of homeless, that's where a lot of the industrial entities that have become vacant. So when I'll give someone the address and they'll be like, all right, you got to go into the, because you, because you couldn't even go in the front door to get to my, my, oh, my, my loft. You had to go through the back portion. So when I, 
and the door that you have to go through doesn't have an outside knob to it, so I have to go up the stairwell to open it, and they'll see me like, hey, you know, and then I've got them down the, this crazy little staircase, and they're like, uh, I hope you're not kidnapping me, you know? And I'm just like, no, it's, I'm like, it's okay. Once you get down there, it'll be, you, it'll blow your mind. So I, I had to always say that during the actual stairs. And then when the individuals will get down and they'll go into the loft and they walk in and they're just like, whoa, like who does this? You know, and it's, it, it doesn't even look like a home. It looks like a, you know, at that point, there was no esports arenas. There was no Mavs gaming. There was no complexity. There was no esports Arlington. There was no 100,000 there. There was none of that there mm -hmm. at that time. So people, this was their first time seeing a space that was geared towards spectator experiences outside of just the, the land gaming experience, right? So this was more of, if I come there, I'm going to see a show. I'm going to see a production. I'm going to see a spectator element, and I'm going to see competitors going crazy and I always coin it as the the eight mile reference when they was in the basement and every it was hot everybody was just like going crazy. Oh, yeah. But that that was a true representation of or you know a core community, um a grassroots community. And that's our core when I think about this company and the years that we've been in it. It's just it stayed grassroots. We just figured out how to be efficient and how to grow within that grassroots uh matter. Well, here's what I do love about your grassroots growth is that again, you've stayed close to the community. You're you're yeah. in uh, you're actually located, I believe, now in DeSoto, Texas. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Which is just outside yes. Dallas. Mm -hmm. And but here's the thing. Uh, while I was doing a search for exposure and trying to get some more information about your company, other than asking you, I was doing some prep. Yeah. <laughs> I also noticed that you're working with the DeSoto um, Park District, and you ran yes. some opportunities for children this summer for lo 25 bucks for. Mm -hmm. For it. And here's what I love about that is that, yes, grassroots and yes, hardcore gamers and yes, all that. But how do we get more grassroots? How do we get more hardcore gamers? How do we get we got to come in and, and, and invite people in and and yes. three, you know, three hundred dollars is not going to invite somebody in twenty five dollars, yes. though. That's going to exactly. invite that's going to invite the curious. So exactly. with that said and with what I also love about what you guys have are now, because I think you've evolved. You've, you are no longer just a software company. You yeah. are now a space where all aspects of that whole STEM, STEAM, and beyond, yes. and not just STEM and STEAM. P people seem to think just because esports happens on computers that it's all science and technology. Yeah, it is everything. Sure. And how, is, yes. how has your space evolved since that time you were in the dojo to a, uh, if you haven't seen it online, there'll be a link. A most yeah. glorious. Actually, I might use it as a cover for this podcast episode. The most beautiful esports dedicated space that I've seen yet. I mean, yeah, really, is. For sure. I, How did you I, get I'll there? You, I, I easily, you know, like you know, the same story. And when you go into a, a little basement, you know, and you have to convert that experience. I'm not scared of putting hard work in, right? There's not. There's no scare to that. Actually, when you don't have a lot of resources, you're forced to do that. You know, so when I knew that we started to grow out of this space, this 2,000 square foot space, when the you know the landlord or the the bit the, the maintenance, they were like, dude, like you're it's three o'clock in the morning, everybody's screaming and stomping and they're having like you're gonna have to find another space. It forced me to think about a bigger space, and you know I started searching all around. I was like, one, how do I find a bigger space? How do I? And at that point, you then had the Mavs game, and you had the other places that have been built. Because I was in there for like three years, and the last year, that's when the the, the esports stadiums and stuff were being built. So I was just like, whoa, how am I going to even like compete with that when you have each of the entities owned by billionaires, right? I'm like, there's no way that I can be able to do it. So. I literally started to source like vacant buildings. And at this point, um, ITT Technical, they had went out of business maybe like four or five years ago. And I had seen this building here and it was completely trashed. It was, it was a big building, but it hadn't been vacant for like four years. And so mm -hmm. at that point, I went to the landowner and was just like, hey, I think I may have a good concept. You know, I, I, I want to know if you will let me come in there and, and build it out. And I will just put my own sweat equity inside of building this space out because I think I have something. And he was just like, cool, you know, nobody else is using it. It's like a sore eye. And I just went in there and just, you know, took up carpet, you know, trashed out the, the leftover uh, cabinets. And, you know, it, it was so horrible inside but it, of the space. But it wasn't, as you said, it wasn't I, 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 T, uh, uh, tech, uh, tech space, right? So no. I assume it, it had all the power, it had all the wiring that you were going to need. Yeah, had least. all the wire. 
Yes, had all the wiring, had the server room. Um, you know, granted the equipment was in there, but it had the, the additional rooms. And when I recognized, like, I, I want I want to teach anybody. I want to I want to turn esports into a school, just like this podcast, the a Academy of Esports. I really want to teach esports, and I didn't want a large arena, open arena. I really wanted to be segmented. So when I seen this space, and it had a library in here, it had a uh, a concession room, it had I just really knocked down walls and built out a my rendition of what an esports school should look like. You know, and in this instance, now it's like we have a 4,500 square foot space for the competition and the spectator that can fit 300. But there's eight rooms that used to be classrooms that are here for shoutcasting, podcasting, uh, that of classrooms to teach individuals how to um, play Fortnite or how to play Street Fighter, or then also understand how the management perspective of esports, the marketing perspective, the competition, the production, and the technology that goes inside of it. I can segment all these rooms to really teach students the ins and out of esports, only from my perspective, but the, it allows us to bring in subject matter experts to teach them as well, so they can get a full dynamic of what goes on in this industry, so they can see that it's not just about gaming. This is a whole industry in which there's a lot of career opportunities that's available that people are just starting to recognize. So I tell individuals here, it's like you have something that is unheard of, and if you don't benefit from it, or if you don't like take advantage of it, then ultimately it's going to pass you and you're going to be in that position where everybody around the world is taking advantage of it. And you're going to be like, man, I had the opportunity right on my nose and I didn't even take it. And that's how I'm able to engage with our community because our community in this area, definitely south of, da south of Dallas, they're a little bit slower to catch on to things because of resources. So for me, I have that burning desire to say, no, let's Let's, this is right in front of you. I want to make it to where it's resourceful and efficient for you. And ultimately, hopefully, can come back as what we've experienced right now with even the gamers that have come through there. Right now, we're at like seven gamers that have turned pro. You know, one of those gamers, Dave Fry, he just won the championship with the Wizards DG, right? So now he comes and be like, whoa, thank you for that experience. I'm and sorry, I'm all about I'm all about bucks. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but go <Awesome>. on. <laughs> yeah, just being able to see and utilize the alumni to incite the inspiration from a younger in person, a younger individual when they come here and see someone that's done it, that's engaged, that are doing really good at what they do in this industry. That's how people in our area see things. They got to see it. That's why people in our industry, they see LeBron James, they see Michael Jordan, they want to be them. They want to be that artist, that celebrity. What I've tried to do is make sure that the individuals within this in the industry are celebrities, so therefore they can inspire the youth to want to go this route and they can see the benefit. And that's the purpose of this space. And it, it's important too. And, and, and especially you as, as a African-American, it's important too for the youth because esports has a problem with diversity. It has a problem yes. with um, uh, inclusion. And it's amazing that the, these kids, and we say this in education as well too, with teaching, the kids need to see themselves in their teachers and their leaders. Yes. And it's, it's something that is so missing in esports, that messaging, that, hey, sweat equity, hey, that work, hey, this is, this is something that you can do on the side and just have fun with it. Or as you say, you can seize it, grab it and do something real with it. And even on your website, the other thing that I do love right at the top uh, about your company is education plus esports equals opportunity. And yes. I think that's what you've, what I think the multi-million dollar spaces, you know, the, the billionaire funded spaces have really missed is anybody can make an arena. Anybody yeah. can, anybody can set up, 30 computers and put them in a row and, and charge five bucks an hour, and give them all the yeah. games. That's easy. The thing that's hard is building the community. The thing that's hard is exactly. building everything else around it. And again, I've seen from your videos and I've seen from your website, and I hope we can do this in February because I'm expected to come down to Dallas to speak at TCEA. I hope to come see it for real. So yes. what is what is stopping you, I guess, right now? from just saying, you know what, we talk about this being an education or a school space, but like formalizing your, your space into an actual school, like an actual, like, you know, charter school or something like that, because I've always been looking for the Hogwarts of esports, and yeah. you just about have it. Yeah, I'm just, it's almost there. You know, one, one of the things is just 
there's two elements. Uh, and the first element we've actually been able to capture, and this goes out to anybody that's watching this because it's very critical. It's when you're building a community, you have to go from the top down approach. And one of the biggest things that we did was we, when we opened up this space, we had an event where I invite, I personally invited all the mayors in this area. So we're in the middle of Duncanville, Cedar Hill, DeSoto, Lancaster, Red Oak, Waxahachie, Dallas. And so purposely, and almost to the point to where you have to do it to where you're not bringing up esports, but letting them kind of congregate to say, how can you help the cities and the, and the cities being more impactful? I brought them into the space and they were able to say esports and learn about it. Well, most importantly, they were able to touch it and feel it. We mm -hmm. actually allowed the mayors to get on stage and compete amongst each other in Rocket League, right? So mm -hmm. now their mindset is like, whoa, now we get it. We see why kids are engaged. It's fun. It's competitive. It's teamwork. There's leadership qualities inside of this. And once they feel it and understand it, now they can be able to showcase it to their staff, their administrators, their principals, and then the instructors, and then the actual students get that real-time perspective, and now everybody comes together to support the cause. So just having that element in itself, now the teachers are saying, okay, how do we incorporate this into our instruction on, within the school? And then ultimately, once they get out of school, how do they come in and actually have a job inside of this place. And I look at this as I want to combine this with the school, but after the school is taking place, here's an opportunity for you to come and utilize this as more of your college. Putting together events, working with big clients, understanding production, understanding coaching, recruiting, and all the different elements that goes in esports. I look at this as more of a in-between for the students that don't want to go to college, right? There's, mm -hmm. there, I mean, in our area, there's a lot of individuals who do not want to go to college. One, because they can't afford it. And two, it just, it just, it just is not foreseeable for them because they don't see themselves in that position. So I want to be in that middle ground where it's saying, hey, if college isn't for you, here's another step process for you. And you may be artsy. You may be, I was that kid where if it didn't speak to me, I was not listening to it. Sports, mm -hmm. I listened to, right? My coach was able to talk to me in a way where I said, I'll go run those extra laps, you know, you know, you know. Huh. So for me, <laughs> I'm glad you could. Yeah, that was the moment. <laughs> I hate. I've I've played rugby for over 20 years, and it's somebody says, "Isn't there a lot of running in rugby?" I say, "Well, not for me. There isn't, because <laughs> I just I'm one of those old guys who just won't run. Yeah, I right. hate running, but um, yeah, just... <laughs> but it, it it speaks again volumes to to what you've done. But here's another thing too. Again, you've invited in the mayors. You've become known in the community. But COVID hits, right? And yes. of course, in March, your your company was still Geekleets. Uh, you had, I know, we had talked back then as well around that time, talking mm -hmm. about you know some of the the work you were doing to develop online courses and course materials, yes. which the production value on those, like I said, are just. If anybody needs, if everyone want to feel shame about your production value, watch some of Danny's stuff because the value <laughs> per production is so high. But let me say this. Yes. When COVID hits, and again, you're a business that you know thrives in this space, and a lot of people say esports is um, uh, COVID proof. And again, I think the term we came up with is is it's esports or it's COVID resistant. It's not proof. But how have you uh, shifted and changed with the times? And and how is that? Did, did any of this lead to the change to exposure, or was that already in the plans? I mean, how have you how have you worked through this time? It was already in the plans, but COVID forced it to go faster. <laughs> okay. So, and what so, makes it so different other than the name? Because a lot of people change names all the time. Was there a change mm -hmm. in philosophy? Was there a change in... What? what, what? Yeah. Go ahead. Sorry. So, so, yeah. So, you know, when you think of esports and you see that now with COVID, every school around the globe has to be forced to do virtual learning. Well, right before COVID, we were already starting here, you know, right? We were already starting our after school and our summer programs live. So we will have, we already got purchase orders and contracts already in set where schools were going to bust their students here after school from four to 6 p.m. And we we're gonna allow them to touch on each component, management, marketing, production, competition, technology, and allow them to actually have, go through a two week or eight week um, um, uh, after school program. And then eventually at the end, be able to formulate their own event 
based off of their assessment or based off of what they truly want to do. So now they can leave with, hey, I've actually been a part of an esports event because most people haven't. Most people are not, they're, they're in a background where they haven't seen how to put on an event. And so that's one of our biggest things that we really like. We're like experiential learning is everything. Like putting together an event helps you say, have you, helps you have confidence to say, oh, I can do this. And ultimately, when COVID hit, we were just like, all the schools just sent me emails, just like, what can't do it? What, what can't do it? And those were some of the most intense conversations I've ever had with my team because it, all of my team members were like, what do we do? You know, how do we survive? And I really, that's one of those moments where I remember back in San Francisco when uh, we built the platform and it was used through Facebook and Facebook created sponsor posts and it killed our business model. And we had to like, we went from a lot of users back down and we had to pivot really fast from a mm. software perspective. So it took me back to that moment where I was just like, here it goes, you know, <laughs> you know, like, it's there. we got to figure out how to do this. And because of the software element that we have, it was almost like, well, we got to go virtual too. You know, now do we create this content and put it on different uh, platforms like Canva, uh, Canvas, or any other platforms other, or do we just create our own, right? And we have oh, to and, think uh, about and hold on, hold on, before you give the big reveal, because mm -hmm. I love this part. Go, go, share this because yeah, it is gorgeous. Sure, you know? Go ahead. <laughs> For sure, you know, we like, we had to say, can we create our own? And I started thinking about it, it's like, are there any esports centric elements, learning management systems that are out there? And we really couldn't identify as many. So we were just like, okay, let's just, let's just create it. Let's just see about creating. I had my dev team, they started building out the platform uh, based off of advice of the industry. And then I went on to start creating content. So ultimately, it was seven o'clock in the morning, get in here, start to create over a hundred videos, content pieces that breaks down all of those segments in which I mentioned into modules and then ultimately in topics and then ultimately into assignments to the point so now where we like have content that we can put onto our software platform and we can make it easier for the institution or high school to be able to digest that content in the most feasible opportunity in the most feasible way. And so therefore, once we actually had to create it, we took almost, I say three weeks, we built this technology platform. I'm talking about day in, day out, day in, day out to the point to where it's 18 to 20 hours of days where we're just like in the trenches, as we call it here. And we knew that we had to build it because we knew we had to get those schools back. Right. Mm -hmm. So we were just like, OK, let's we got to give the schools something that they can engage with during this summer because um, it was at March. It was like the March area. So we were yep. just like. We got, we're fighting against summer, so we built the platform and the schools were just like, wow, how did, one, how did y'all do this so fast? And two, this is incredible because now the students can get this same um, vision of what we thought it was going to be in a live setting, but they actually are able to get it virtually. And that was one of the biggest things where we were like, okay, we have something. And in order for us to actually get into, you know, more institutions and prop more opportunities to the, the organizations in our community, we wanted to make it more appealing to education. And so that's what prompted the rebrand. We were just like, we got gamers, we've seen gamers, uh, we have a track record of gamers turning pro, but now we need to highlight the most important element of esports, and that's the professional careers outside of gaming. And if we can do this right, we need to rebrand to make the comp make the organizations and the institutions feel more comfortable. And when you see a graduation cap and when you see education plus esports equal opportunity, that can make our job easier when it comes down to engaging with these institutions. And we knew we had the platform. We knew we had the expertise. We knew we had the visual uh, content. Now we just have to have the rebrand to say, this is who we are and this is who we're going to be. Are, who, this is who we will be in the next 10 to 20 years. And I was ready to do this. So it was just like a let's get it done. We did so much work after COVID. And I know 10 to 20 years from now, I'm going to look back and I'm going to be like, how did that even happen? But it was sheer desire, it's sheer passion, and it's the ability to engage with our team and tell them, like, hey, this is the times. Everybody around the globe right now has a transition. I used the example when I ran track. If we ran track and we were set foot on that track, and if it was raining, if it was windy, if it was really, really hot, everybody on that same track has to experience the same thing, mm. right? And so at this point right now, we have to overcome this as a team because I can guarantee your neighbor, someone in Dubai, somebody in Africa, somebody in UK, they're going through the exact same thing. So we have no excuse. This is a time to dive down deep, 
pull our britches up, and then be able to execute for the betterment of the students who really want to have an opportunity in this space of esports. And if we don't do it right now, we'll never do it. And our team just got into it, and they, they got all together, and just we just created it. Well, and, and to, to let the audience know, too, who's listening, I have seen, okay, so in my day job, I oversee a virtual learning program. So LMSs, learning management systems, online courses, those are, that's, I live and breathe in those things. Mm -hmm. And it is an interesting world, we shall say, because yes. you can have Canvas, you can have Buzz, you can have all these different learning platforms, but nothing matters until you put the courses in. And when yes. you put those courses in, they are either sometimes really good, a lot of times they're built really poorly. Like the interface is bad. Oh gosh, Danny, I've got so many right now that I had to shut off course access to because they were still using Flash and they haven't updated yet. Yes, and exactly. So when I saw the learning platform that Danny had built from scratch, it was the most beautiful thing I've ever seen. And that it wasn't awesome. just that it was beautiful, it's that it was completely functional. It works. Yes. And I think I, I forgot what I told you other than I think I warned you like, well, you, you, better, keep <laughs> you better keep this under wraps for a little bit until you've got it all yeah. done because somebody's gonna come, because you know, a Pearson or somebody, you know, these big, these big education companies, they look for stuff like this. And, yeah. and, sure. But like I said, what you have built is absolutely stunningly beautiful. And the content, from what I've seen of uh, early versions of some of the content, high quality experience and yes. stuff that will translate. If the child is learning this right now remotely, when they get the chance to come to the exposure yes. uh, arena, the place, they'll they'll be able to experience it all hands on as well. The trans exactly. the, I can see the translation. I can see the transfer of learning. It's amazing. But here's the other thing I love too, Danny, is that you are you know you have you have set up shop in Dallas in the Dallas area, and everybody when they think of esports, they think um, they think California, um, they think Korea, uh, to a lesser extent maybe San Francisco or Seattle. Yes. But I look at the state of Texas yes. and what Texas has done for esports. And to me, and I had Danielle Johnson on, on my last yeah. episode, and she's with TechSep, and they, have that, they, have, they already have one of the best esports associations in the country, and they just started. Yeah. But Texas has become a special place for esports in the world, not just in the United States, but in the world. And you're, you're, a, you're a big part of that, my friend. Yeah, for sure. And it's just been like just to see how it all comes together. And it's really the inspiration comes from seeing all the different other states as well, because you see in Atlanta, you see in San Diego, you're seeing so many different entities and how their communities are formulating. So every time I see it, I get inspired and I push our core community together to say, hey, let's add value. This industry is growing. Let's all add unique value. There's no purpose on us trying to overlap each other and just outbeat each other. Let's come together and if we come together, we can inspire. Most importantly, it's inspiring individuals to want to do better. I tell my mother all the time, it's like, you know, I'm going, like, you, like you've done some awesome things in this world with what you've had, and that's admirable, and I want to come in, and I want to be able to do that exact same thing, if not better, so therefore I can inspire somebody else to come in and do it better than me. It's that cycle that needs to be there in a positive manner, and I look at that like our community. Every student that comes through there, every institution that we're engaging in, and we're starting to engage with institutions and organizations at a fast rate right now. So we're looking at it as like, we really want to make sure that every student that comes through our platform is able to get some valuable knowledge so therefore they can go and represent a larger entity and that can ultimately help the industry grow because that's the number one priority well and that's the other thing too that i think a lot of i won't say the the nonprofit state associations because they are so educationally focused but there are a lot of companies that are trying to seize on the esports um uh, yeah. scholastic esports market right yeah and a lot of times all they're trying to do is just set up tournaments. It's all I hear is tournaments, yeah. tournaments, tournaments, tournaments. And it's like, exactly. again, anybody can do a tournament, anyone, exactly. it, you know, developers aside, if the developer says only this company can do the tournament, well, in education, we sometimes just go, eh, come you know, right. tell us, tell us not to, it's fine. But <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, but you know, that's the, that's the thing that a lot of these people who are looking at scholastic esports miss is, is, and here's what I'm not hearing you say, you said it at the beginning, but it's not what the message is now. Cause again, yeah. your company has evolved at the beginning. You were like, Hey, we had all these people come in. We've got seven, two K, you know, participants in NBA two K league. 
But that I have not heard you say hey, to these to these kids now that you're bringing in, hey, we're going to turn you into 2K pros. We're going to turn you into yeah. these kind of pros. You're saying yeah. like we're going to make you a pro at all these other things in life that you can possibly For do. Sure. For sure. And, you know, we still have the element, you know, of the competition, you know, but ultimately we know that based off of statistics, we still know that it's just like traditional sports. You're going to, with the infrastructure, college is just starting to start to do leagues and, you know, not to say just start, but you're starting to see an uptick in leagues and college and uh, support in that realm. But it's still the dynamic. If you want to go pro, you're considered that, you know, that, that Jordan, you consider that Kobe that goes pro directly from high school, and that's still very small. Mm -hmm. We just happen to be very lucky in three years to engage with so many professional athletes now in the gaming realm, and it, it's, it's geared towards, you know, being there and working and always having somewhere so somebody can come and prove their skill, but that's still very rare. And so what we do know is we can have, it's it, it wouldn't feel comfortable for me to continuously say, go pro, go pro, go pro, when that's all you're focusing on. But I can tell the same person, like, go pro, if you don't make it, here's all these other opportunities that you can engage with. And if you don't choose that, then that I feel bad about that. So I really want to push that, here's this, it's great and all, but here's all of the different graphic designers, here's the videography, photographies, here are the coaches, recruiters, here's the, element, the elements of development, web development, building out a platform. I can speak on building out a development platform because we just did it. So mm -hmm. any student that comes, they can I can talk to them about coding and how to build a team. I can talk to them about every element in esports because you we had to do it. <laughs> we were right. forced to do it. You know, so that's it's, it's only it only makes sense. You know, and for the individuals who are very good at what they do, I can then bring them in here to teach that person who says I found out what I want to do. I want to be a graphic designer. Now, Danny, could you put me around some of the best graphic designers in the world? Yes, uh, my pleasure. I'll go find them, and I'll make sure that you're learning at the most opt opportune time and how you can add those benefits to your portfolio to do really, really awesome work. And, and what I'm seeing right now with esports and pop culture awesome. is a lot of like what I saw when I was a kid in the 80s and 90s between NBA and pop culture. Where yeah, for sure. NBA was really the first sport to have people who could make money off of the NBA without being a basketball player, right? Yeah. Because there was sure. the clothing, there was the merchandise, there was, again, yes. the cross promotions. Um, Esports is doing that right now. And, and again, even if these kids come to you and they are like me, I'm a terrible gamer. I'm one of the worst. You could coach me all day. It's not going to get any better. But <laughs> you sit me down and show me how to do shout casting in a professional way, how to do these kind of mixing of overlays yes. or building my own those are skills that even if i don't even ever do anything with esports ever again that's something that when i go to a company and they say hey we need you on our marketing department it doesn't matter yes. what i'm selling at this point i can make what you need exactly for sure and you have it you have it spot on and one of the things that a lot of people do not recognize for our entity is that we have the staff we went from maybe like when the, when COVID we had, I think I, in that room and that meeting, that tough meeting, it was about a seven of us. Mm -hmm. um, now we're at 21 staff members now, right? In three months. And so in this instance, these staff members are students from high school to college to post-college. And so we're doing work right now with Columbia. We're, we're commissioned to do, we just get disengaged with EFUSE. Um, we're engaged right now with large yes. entities, and these are students creating their portfolios. And now mm. they can go home and say, wow, I just did a production, or I just did an event or, uh, with a large Fortune 500 company. And that is true engagement for these students because it shows you education and opportunity, education and entertainment, education and, and equals opportunity. And so in this instance, it, you educate and then you put into the field, as they say, and then that creates the opportunity when it comes down to it. So I, I, I live it by experiential learning because I'm that person I have to touch, I have to build something. Um, and that's how I learn. And I know that there's a lot of other students out there um, that, are, that are in that same position because if they're not touching it, they're not, they're not, they're not in tune with it. They don't, they don't, they're not focused on it. They don't care right. about it. And at this instance right now, that's the best uh, gift that I can give to an instructor in a school to say, let's figure out a way to make sure that the students that are not participating, that are not engaged, 
they may be the people that needs to feel it and touch it and be able to see that they created something for them to get excited and inspired. Those are the students also that are really somebody I really want to be able to engage with and work here at this space. And, and I will say this too, Danny, because you, you did touch on this earlier, you know, about, you know, college isn't necessarily for everybody, at least out the gate. And I know gap yeah. years right now are becoming very popular. Yeah. Even my oldest, she's, she's 16, she's talked about it. But I think about my 12 year old son who loves gaming, loves to do certain things. And, you know, if he came to me and said, boy, I really want to take a gap year and I ask him what his plan is. If he has no plan, this is something that I could say, here's an option. Yeah, so exactly. I, I love your idea, Danny. I love the concept. I love the space. I can't wait. I hope that in February I can come to Dallas yeah, and come sure. down and see the exposure space myself. Uh, Danny, do you have any final words for us today on the Academy of Esports? Yes, I, I, I love to be able to end with, um, you know, this industry is growing. There's a lot of opportunities for individuals to showcase their skills and to identify a pathway for long-term success. Um, the number one thing is being humble and then also always looking for new learning opportunities. Um, at this time space right now, everybody is seeking new learning opportunities. And so never get to that point where you feel like you're just capped always ask questions no matter if you're coming into this industry to diversify your portfolio if you're a tenured staff member or you're a tenured entrepreneur looking to get into this looking to invest if you're a student that's looking at esports as an opportunity for you to really do something of passion never stop your learning always ask questions there are podcasts such as yourself that are <laughs> continuously being able to let people know what's going on i remember looking at your podcast when where was i at i remember um, I had to be in, in, I think I was, I was it, when we were first building this place out, I had it on my computer and I went through every one and just listening to it. And I was like, okay, this is cool. I'm <laughs> learning every single day about it. And, you know, I'm doing Tommy, uh, Tommy naps right now. I'm doing his, his podcast. So like I'm, I'm learning and it, it takes for you to always develop. And so uh, when you create content, you literally inspire me to want to feel comfortable creating content because that's totally not out of my my realm to create content like this. Uh, but I looked at you doing it and I'm just like, OK, it's possible. <laughs> you know, it's possible. And I really appreciate it because it inspired me and I'm sure it's going to inspire other individuals out there. So never be afraid to continuously learn. And that's the last thing that I have to be able to say. I'll just end it at that. Danny Martin, thank you so much for being a guest on the Academy of Esports podcast. That will do it for this week on the Academy of Esports. I've been your host, James O'Hagan. Esports are organized competitive video games allowing schools to redefine their athletic culture, diversify opportunities for student participation, promote good physical and mental health, increase collegiate scholarship pathways, and play games. We can never forget the importance of play. The mission of the Academy of Esports is to support these ideals. The vision of the Academy of Esports is for all students to experience the fun and joy of playing competitive video games. You may follow me on Twitter at Jim O'Hagan. That's at J-I-M-O-H-A-G-A-N and through the Academy of Esports account at T-A-O Esports. It's a great way to get the latest blog posts podcast episodes, and news coming out of esports and education. And remember, you can continue your engagement by going to www.taoesports.com. You can also connect through Facebook at www.facebook.com slash taoesports. Thanks again for listening, and I look forward to our time again next week.